Hi, I'm Harry Siemens, and with the Manitoba Aerial Applicators Association, and today uh, we're visiting with John Bagley. He also owns and operates uh, Westmont Aerial Spraying, and we're talking about a lot of things that have to do with aerial application, crop protection products, and exactly how these guys do it day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute. Great to have you with us. Today I'm visiting with John, and John, tell me about the whole aspect of Manitoba Aerial Applicators Association and, and uh, your involvement in it and what they do. Well, at, at, at this point in my life, I'm just a member of the Aerial Applicators Association. I have uh, served as past president and uh, president of our Canadian Aerial Applicators Association. but. Um, I did my time, and now I'm a, an active supporter, a member of the association. The member, uh, all of the members come together as a group to, um, to, to deal with issues regarding aerial application in Manitoba, and, and then of course our national body uh, issues across Canada. Um, we try to promote safety and understanding of our industry. Um, we uh, deal with issues, regulatory issues and uh, uh, safety issues regarding accidents and pilot training and um, uh, advertising of our industry to put a positive spin on, on, uh, on our industry. We feel that we do a lot for uh, Canadian agriculture and uh, support um, the uh, production of food in Canada. So, uh, and in Manitoba in particular, we have a large uh, very intensive crop uh, plan with a lot of farmers, a lot of potatoes in Manitoba. So aerial application is very necessary part of uh, agriculture in Manitoba for sure. We'll get into that a bit more, but first of all, tell me about your business. I know I drive along number one highway and I've seen it for years. I've known you in the past when I did some work with the association, but uh, tell me about your business. I look outside and I see the plane standing there. It's a little windy today, but mm -hmm. tell me. Well, we started the business in 1989. We're just coming up on 30 years in business. Um, time flies by, no pun intended. Um, and uh, we started off in a small grass strip that I rented from a local farmer friend. And then in 1993, we moved to this site. And it was, I guess, my mission statement and, and my goal to create a site that was um, of value to the local community uh, and the local farmers. So over the years, we've just continually built this site since 1993. Um, and uh, uh, a few years ago, I sold the retail portion of the site, but at that time, we, we uh, had uh, full uh, crop care, full line of crop care products. We developed a seed uh, treatment and seed uh, sales business, uh, certified seed, uh, full mm -hmm. liquid and dry fertilizer plant, ground sprayers, floaters, um, we sold bins and equipment. We employed up to 60 people locally in this area and uh, always felt that we would, whenever we could, we bought locally and, and tried to inject money into the local economy. So um, I was happy to sell that part of the business in 2014. And now we've, I've just returned to my roots with the airplanes. That's all we do right now. And, um, we, at this point, we have six spray airplanes and six pilots, and a couple of years ago we added a helicopter to our fleet so that we could do some specialized spraying in certain areas, and um, I'm enjoying it. I've been an ag pilot for almost 30 years now. Wow. 30, sorry, 35 years. Yes. Sounds exciting. Yeah. Tell me, you made a reference to how the ag industry, and I, I've been involved in the ag industry for 47 years as a journalist before I farmed uh, before that I farmed for 10 years but uh, why is it so vital that we have that very good successful aerial applicators business for the farmers uh, for some farmers it's it's a it's a service that they call on when uh, when we have an insect outbreak or something that's out of the norm for them um, but for many farmers it's a it's a part of their uh, annual um, budget, so budget to speak, they, right? Yes. Yeah. 
uh, they have uh, th there's uh, for, for instance a, a new a new thing that uh, that's just come into the marketplace over the last few years is shatter uh, resistant canola so you don't have to swath your canola so that has to be sprayed to help dry it down uh, before they go in and straight cut it uh, it's a perfect application for aerial applica uh, applicators because um, we can go in and not make any tracks in the field we don't we don't disrupt the pods as we fly over it and uh, um, get it to the point where the farmers can harvest it. Potato farmers are a perfect example where we uh, do a lot of work uh, for those farmers because um, there's been lots of studies where, you know, as you move from one field to the next with a ground spray, you can move disease from one field to the next. Uh, wheel compaction is a big issue in potatoes for potato quality and so on. So the airplanes are a perfect vehicle for that also. Um, we're not out to compete with the ground sprayers, but we're, we complement the ground sprayers in many ways. Um, our business has changed drastically over the last 30 years. You know, when I started, we would do probably half of our season would be herbicides, and the rest would be insecticides or fungicides. Now, I would say 95% of our business is fungicides on wheat and canola to increase yields. Um, there's some very, um, very good products out there that help the farmer uh, get their yields up so that they're more productive and we can help produce more, more food for the world. Totally, and, uh, and that's awesome because agriculture, as a veteran farm broadcaster told me years ago, he says it's really the basic industry, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, uh, it's a renewable resource. You can keep doing it time and time again, right? Uh, just as we stopped over here at another place, uh, we visited with a young fella, and, and I told him we were coming to visit you. And guess what he did? He pulled out his iPhone and showed us a picture of an aerial applicator plane that he had just taken this morning. I, oh, yeah. I think that's yeah. probably, and, and I remember driving into Winnipeg a few days ago and, and you know, there I saw the, the guy, it, it's exciting. And, it and, and, it's, uh, and yet these guys are doing a job just like everybody else, mm -hmm. except there's a lot more into it. Yes. Well, you know, people that aren't familiar with aerial application um, think that uh, we're maybe risk takers. Uh, that's absolutely not the case. This, this job is like any job that you're not, uh, if you weren't used to it, uh, it would seem that you could get injured in the job. And I'm not going to say that we were accident free by any stretch. But our accident rates are very, very low. And uh, we take a lot of precautions. Uh, we've got systems set up. Uh, Transport Canada um, obviously wants us to have safety systems in our, in our company. Uh, um, I guess, sorry. Just because, no, no. I, I, obviously they, they want to make sure yeah. you're safe because that's their job. Yes, so, so a lot of our safety uh, uh, procedures that we have in the company, um, we talk about at our aerial applicators meetings and we've developed systems that we put into place that try to minimize any risk that we're gonna take. Uh, when somebody's driving down the road and they see a spraying, sometimes they think, you know, those guys are just being way too aggressive. Um, the airplanes are very, very safe nowadays. M most of our airplanes uh, for, for established aerial applicators are turbine powered, which are extremely reliable engines compared to what we used to fly with. Mm. Um, we have to do regular maintenance. Um, all of the pilots, when, by the time you get into a turbine powered airplane, are very experienced. And although it may look exciting, uh, to us, it's a job, yep. and we take it seriously. We are all family members, uh, family people. We have families to come home to, and we, we try to do our job safely and uh, make sure that we don't uh, cause any problems in the process. I guess there's always the whole aspect that I remember years ago, at least, uh, you know, the whole the aspect of not so much risk of, of accident, but risk of uh, chemical drifting and, and those kinds of things. And, and even in some cases, and I'm sure you've got safety things to follow, but where maybe somebody had, and that can happen to a ground sprayer too, right? I'm not Absolutely. singling out yes, the, yes. an area applicator, but obviously that's something that you're always conscious of. Yes, um, there's been a lot of advancement over the years with nozzle technology to try and make sure that we have the proper droplet size so that the 
uh, chances of off-target drift are minimized. Um, obviously, we spray in maybe different conditions than a lot of ground sprayers would. We're very conscious of the wind. We notice it as soon as we get in the air um, because we're flying in the air mass. So as soon as it starts to get bumpy, we know it's starting to get windy. Um, we shut down earlier than maybe a ground sprayer would. By the time it gets to be 15 kilometers or somewhere in that, that range, we're looking at uh, shutting down for the, the morning and then waiting until the evening when the wind dries, dies down again and then we'll start up again. So we have uh, early mornings, late evenings, we do a lot of our spraying. Um, <coughs> we have vehicles on our aircraft or, or equipment on our aircraft that allows us to measure how far our product is going to drift. And we have um, uh, different devices, other devices on our aircraft that allow us to minimize um, how we uh, trim up a field so that we don't have any off-target drift. So there's, there's lots of different things that are available now that weren't uh, 30 years ago. It's, uh, it, it's, it, to me it is, it is exciting because I've had a chance to work alongside with people like yourself and other people and I also remember a fellow from Winkler, his name was Ben Weeb. Ben was an aerial applicator and he was a very good friend of mine. But I also flew with him commercially during flood times, mm -hmm. and this guy didn't take any chances. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was an instructor, he was a flyer, he was an aerial applicator. He was mm -hmm. one of the first guys in our area. Mm -hmm. He's since passed on. And, mm -hmm. and at the same time, though, when I flew with him, uh, I felt, boy, this guy is just, I wish he'd take a few more chances. But no, he flew by the book. Absolutely. Um, we do the same thing here. We have six airplanes working out of here pretty well every day at our strip. Uh, we probably have more aircraft movements out of our strip here than Brandon does at the uh, at the city airport during the summertime. Um, so we f we follow the same procedures when we come into land as we would at Brandon. We just don't have a, a, an air traffic controller, but we call as we enter the circuit and we make sure that everybody knows where we are. And uh, you know, there's other aerial applicators that work in this area. We've set up communications with them so we can know where they are and and so on. So. Uh, we're, we're very careful. Um, we now have the benefit of GPS technology, which is just phenomenal for our yeah. industry. Um, it allows us to navigate directly to a field rather than flying to an elevator and then counting miles like we used to do. Um, so it's, you know, the chances of getting to the wrong field have been eliminated. Um, uh, we know prior to going out there, we have a system uh, that we utilize on our computer that uh, allows us to put in all of the organic farms that we know of uh, from the uh, Organic Growers Association. So we know when we're going to be spraying next to an organic farm. We know where all the towers are. We also have what we call um, our customer re request list um, where uh, people that don't want us flying over their yard or uh, don't like the noise of the airplane in the morning because they're shift workers and that type of thing. We put all of those those uh, yard sites into our computer so when we're going out to the field we know to avoid those areas. Um, in fact we just bought a couple of new airplanes last year and this year that uh, are kind of the whisper quiet airplanes so they've got extra blades on the propeller so that uh, and, and really they have extra power too but we didn't buy them for that we bought them because we have to interface with a lot of urban people nowadays mm. and a lot of urban people that work in the cities are moving outside the city into the countryside next to Brandon or other towns. And uh, we're trying to be respectful of that. Even, uh, even though we do still have to carry out our jobs, we try to respect their privacy and, and their right to have acquired existence, I guess. So we've got these airplanes that are total, almost totally quiet. They're as quiet as a truck going down the road. Is that right? Um, so we're pretty pleased with that. And I've had a compliment from one customer that uh, that didn't like the noise in the past and she said I just can't believe how quiet that airplane is so I live in Winkler mm -hmm. I live not far from the airport there mm -hmm. and I hear the noise especially I'm, I'm an early riser yes. I hear the planes uh, warming up and taking off you know you can hear that you always know when it's an aerial applicator taking off right mm -hmm. so they start pretty early tell yes. me John as a pilot what do you do when uh, when, when you get ready for the next day of spraying? Okay, well, I get up at 3.30 in the morning, every day, uh, check the wind, 
make sure that it's good to go, and then um, then I start calling the pilots and the ground crew. My wife calls the ground crew, and I call the pilots, and uh, we try to get here by about four thirty, and then um, and then by five o'clock we're in the air. That's during July. As the season goes on, then of course daylight comes a little bit later in the morning, but. By five, uh, we can see to get when we get to the field and start to spray. So uh, then we spray until the wind starts to pick up. By about eleven o'clock, quite often or, or noon, we have to shut down. Some days it's earlier, and then we sit, the pilots go home and have a rest. Um, and uh, and then by about four o'clock, uh, a new weather forecast comes out. I look at it. I make a determination whether they should start heading in or not, and then we spray for the evening if it's good. By about 10 o'clock, we're back home again, okay. getting ready to get up in a few hours to come back at it. Yeah. So, you have different seasons, yeah. obviously, right? I mean, you have, uh, so tell me about the, take me through the seasons. Um, well, uh, we have, are you talking about the uh, I'm air, you're talking, Yeah, the, the different the crops season? that you'd spray oh, yes, and okay. use different yes. products for. Yes, okay, so in the, in the spring, we start off, uh, quite often there'll be some insects uh, that maybe get away in canola like uh, uh, flea beetles and so on that uh, the new insecticides just can't uh, manage until the canola gets a little bit larger. So we may spray some insecticide first thing in the spring. Um, we also send airplanes down to Quebec to do some spruce budworm spraying. Uh, they're gone for a month. And then by about the middle of uh, Jul uh, June, we start spraying potatoes and we, we also do some herbicide work in typically nowadays it's in mainly in pastures and uh, fence lines and that kind of stuff. Um, we used to do a lot of crop spraying, herbicide crop spraying, but uh, the ground sprays have kind of taken that over and I'm happy to let them do that. Um, uh, and then uh, by the 1st of July we're big time into potatoes and wheat and canola fungicides and that takes us on a normal year that would take us till about the third week of July and then that stops and then we'll carry on with potatoes right through until the middle to the end of September um, and now as I mentioned earlier uh, we have this new market that's emerging I guess is uh, is I don't know if I'd call it desiccating but drying down canola for the uh, the yeah, straight oh, cutting right, canola. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a newer market that will start to expand over the next couple of years. A friend of mine did a story in Saskatchewan mm -hmm. with the aerial applicators there were together with the Saskatchewan government there registering them and maybe training them to get involved in some of the water bombing stuff. Yeah. Is that something uh, that you could talk about here? Well we, uh, <laughs> funny you should mention that, we, we just uh, uh, spent the last 17 years in a, in a what they call a SEAT program, single engine air tanker program with the province of Manitoba. And uh, it was very successful. We, uh, we had some people that were very um, interested in promoting that type of uh, service in Manitoba. Manitoba government has a whole fleet of their own aircraft, uh, uh, Canadair uh, 415s now, uh, which we call water skimmers. They yeah. skim along the water and pick up the water. Manitoba is perfect country for that because they have so many lakes. Yeah. Um, but there was a place for the single engine air tanker and we we got on that uh, program in 2000 and uh, just exited that program in 2017. Uh, we still do do some work for the province, but we had a, a number of drier years. But uh, during that period, we, we built up a, a, a fantastic business with the province and I enjoyed it thoroughly going out and firefighting and protecting communities and forests and that type of thing. It was a very uh, different type of a career for us, um, but it complemented our aerial spraying. And uh, it was a different uh, branch of our business that I was a little bit sad to let go, but uh, that's not the province's direction anymore. So, uh, but we had a, a good time doing it. We had bought some uh, very large airplanes and I got to fly some, some great airplanes and see the north and I actually met my wife up, at, up north. So Okay, <laughs> tell me, um, you know, I took a drones uh, registration course mm -hmm. a couple of months ago mm -hmm. uh, in Winnipeg and uh, you know initially I was going to become 
I thought a drone pilot, but once I took the course, I, I had second thoughts about all the kinds of regula regulations and things, uh, mm -hmm. and, and especially liability. So, d do you have any concerns with the drones uh, flying and getting in the way, or has that never been a problem? Uh, no, we have concerns. Uh, we've had a lot of meetings regarding drones, uh, uh, you know, provincially and nationally, and. Uh, the amount of the number of drones that are going to be in Canadian and U.S. airspace over the next number of years is going to grow exponentially. Totally. And uh, not all of them will be licensed operators. No. Uh, in fact, Fraction. very few of them. Fraction. Uh, so, um, I I'll just use an example in the potato industry. Uh, that industry employs a lot of independent agronomists to come out and scout their crops. And when they do that, the new technology now is to have the drone fly over and they can take special uh, imagery of the field and see if there's deficiencies, uh, you know, in fertilizer and that kind of thing. Um, so they're flying over the same fields that we're spraying. So we, we have developed communication uh, with the drone operators, the independent agronomists. If they're flying drones, they'll call us and ask us where we're flying or they'll call us and tell us where they're going to be flying. Um, I think there needs to be more communication on this um, because uh, it hasn't reached its full potential yet, and I think we'll probably uh, see in the future that you know we'll have to have better ways of, of knowing where these people are going to be. Um, there is a system that's being developed. You know, technology moves so quickly nowadays. Yeah. Um, ADSB is a is a type of a transponder that allows you to see other things oh. in the air, and uh, my helicopter, for instance, will tell me where there's other aircraft flying that have transponders oh. in them. And these drones, if you get, uh, as, the, as the technology gets better and some of the stuff gets cheaper, they'll be able to emit a signal that an airplane with a, the proper type of transponder will be able to detect and know where they are. So there's going to be changes for sure and uh, we'll see that, where that all goes. But there have been some near misses with drones. Um, it would be, uh, it could be devastating depending on where it hit the airplane. Um, but uh, it would be like hitting a big bird, I guess. Uh, yeah. Pretty well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, coming to the end of this uh, segment here, I, and, and you can tell me if it's off base or not, but I, you've come a long way, meaning the industry, mm -hmm. uh, from when, uh, remember the pictures we saw years ago with the, with the guys sitting in an open cockpit and a helmet and they called them crop dusters, right? Yes, yeah. And, and uh, boy, uh, just come a long way. Just to explain that for me. Well, back in the day when, when this whole industry started, um, all, of those, all of those pilots were, ex, uh, uh, were from the war yeah. and they needed a job and that's where this industry evolved from and all of the airplanes were uh, ex-military airplanes and a lot of steermans um, and so on. But now the industry has, you know, we have specialized airplanes that have special safety equipment in them. And, are designed specifically for the job that we do and that are designed uh, to be safely flown in the airspace that we're flying in, which is an, not a normal airspace for a pilot. It's uh, very low to the ground and down in amongst a lot of obstacles and so on. So we have a lot of things there that, um, that other pilots don't have to worry about. Um, so all of the changes that we've made uh, and, uh, and of course, we feel that we're more professional now than back, back in the day when they had an open cockpit and um, you know, could breathe in the fumes. A lot of our products nowadays are so safe. They're safer than um, you know, drinking a cup of coffee, as an example. So you know, the products that we use, the equipment that we use, the training that the pilots have to take. When, when I started 35 years ago, I did take a spray course, but every airplane that I got in after I started that, took that spray course, I had to teach myself how to fly because it only has one seat in it. Nowadays we have dual seat airplanes, pilots can go and take transition training to go from one airplane to another to another. So it's a, it's a totally different industry and the, the professionalism has, has uh, gone up immensely over the years. Yeah. So we're very proud of our industry. We, uh, we have our own insurance fund as an example, where we insure all of our own aircraft in this fund. And uh, we, so now we can track all of our accidents, uh, whereas we couldn't when it was uh, with just public insurance. And our accident rates are 
phenomenally low. I can see uh, that. Even though when there is an accident, it seems to get a headline, the number of accidents compared to the number of hours that we fly in a short period of time and the number of acres that we cover is extremely low for any aviation industry. Anything else you'd like to add? I think that's good for now.